thinking about how do we actually embody love in this world that needs our care. Hi, I'm so happy to see you all. It's really wonderful. I want to thank you for coming and supporting Inside LA. Thank you for your kindness and your generosity uh, to come to the benefit. I want to thank all of our team and our volunteers um, and also to just introduce the Korean Buddhist television network that they're going to be filming this for us this afternoon. And, you know, we're here to celebrate the teachings, to celebrate the teachings that you've all been practicing. Are there any of you who are brand new to Inside LA today who are here for the first time? Okay, quite a few. Welcome. Welcome. We're celebrating these teachings that show us how to embody. We use the word embody because we actually want this to be real, that the love that we cultivate, the compassion, the wisdom, the mindfulness that come out of the practices that we do to train our hearts, is <clears throat> that these qualities are actually lived, that we can bring them into our daily lives and begin to close that gap between our ideals of who we want to be, who our best self could be, and the way we actually act and behave with each other and in our relationships. And it just seems like this is a time when the world really does need our care. I'm sure it always does. but. It does seem that the last few years have been especially challenging for us as a nation and as people who really um, need to find ways to listen deeply to each other and find a way to, to come together and support each other instead of fighting or hating on each other. So here we have come together and we're here to identify with our best selves, the joyful and liberated heart that is a possibility for each one of us, actually, in any given moment. And we have wonderful guests who are here with us. Um, my beloved, Jack Cornfield and George Mumford and Sean Korn, who's here for the first time, really excited about that and Father Greg, who will be joining us in a while. And together in our practice, you know, we create these moments where we pause, we slow into experience. Um, they become moments of beauty. We can really receive each other and the life around us. And moments of possibility and learning, things that we didn't know before. And there's a lot of joy and freedom in that. Uh, when I started Inside LA, it was really just a little sitting group with two people, and Fred and Steve. Uh, and I'm always grateful to Fred and Steve, who came to sit with me. And so it was very tiny, and it was very homemade, and um, it was like cooking from scratch. It's a very complicated recipe, as it turned out. But you don't always start that when you embark on something. And the thing that uh, we did from the start at Inside LA was to have both the Buddhist teachings and the mindfulness teachings that are more secular, and to have them accessible and available uh, to everybody. And also, I wanted, um, because I had lived most of my adult life in Boston and worked for 25 years as a psychotherapist there, working in schools and working a lot with children and families. I really wanted us to be able to take part in and contribute to the community. And I was new to this community. I came to LA. I was already in my mid-50s. I didn't have the things that really fly in Hollywood, like gorgeous beauty and money and connections. I didn't have any of those uh, when I came here. And so I thought, what better way to get connected to the community than to find um, places that need support 
for a while I worked two days a week at Central Juvenile Hall, working with the boys and kids there. And while we didn't call it that at the beginning, we always had insight in action. In other words, the programs and initiatives that come from what we learn in our meditation and what we learn together in our practice, and that are really about serving the people who work on the front lines of suffering in our society, uh, people who are looking homeless folks experiencing homelessness in the eye every single day, people who are taking care of those who are critically ill and dying. We actually have a very um, a short video about the work of Insight in Action, and I'd like you to see it right now. At Inside LA, we practice in embodied compassion and social action. We combine these two elements with our Inside in Action programs. Inside in Action offers mindfulness training to marginalized communities and to caretakers who are on the front lines of suffering. And we do this at no cost to them. I'm really excited to talk about Inside LA and social action partly because it's one of the few places that I know in the country, maybe in the world, which combine the deep inner trainings of compassion and mindfulness and loving awareness and so forth with social action. And this is the very thing that the world needs at this point. Insight in Action is growing beyond Los Angeles. We understand that we're part of a global society and that our well-being is interconnected. We're bigger than the communities around us. So now we're traveling around the world and teaching mindfulness. We go to Tijuana, Chad, Cameroon, and Greece and offer mindfulness training to refugees and to their caretakers. We also have a thriving program in Puerto Rico. Through different cities, we have partnered with nonprofit organizations, schools and healthcare providers who are offering services and teaching mindfulness to youth and community members. I am Delia and I am a facilitator for the Insight in Action program in Puerto Rico. Thanks to the program, we've been able to bring mindfulness to different community-based organizations all throughout the island. Here at home, we're offering trainings to those who work with the critically ill and dying. We've expanded our reach. We're now offering mindfulness in communities such as East LA, South Central, Pico Rivera. We're reaching marginalized communities who otherwise wouldn't be able to come to our centers. Insight in Action is also in public schools through an initiative called Insight in Schools. We're currently developing a curriculum that is culturally sensitive and both trauma and resiliency informed. We're doing this work as an act of social justice to begin to break down the school to prison pipeline to support youth and all of the adults in their lives, whether they're teachers, counselors, social workers, or parents, to become socially, emotionally intelligent, to become compassionate and stronger in their communities. So we're making this video to give you a taste of some of the things that we're already doing and it'll also spark your imagination so you'll think about what is possible, what else might we be able to do if we have the support and if you're with us. So come join us. So you have all come to join us just by virtue of being here. And again, I want to thank you for just being that loving and that generous. And you are here. And I think when I press on this, it stops. Um, and you know, there are a lot of difficult things going on in the world, things that we hear about every single day. And yet, there are also beautiful, magical things that are happening in the world and that are 
possibilities for us, the liberated and joyful heart is a heart that is full of hope. It's a heart that is optimistic. And it's a heart that we all recognize in ourselves and understanding that together we can create change and we can be part of uh, creating the world that we want to be, that we want to live in together and that we want to share with other people together. And the practices that we learn, these simple practices of slowing into experience, of being mindful, what does it even mean? You know, somebody said, you guys talk about the present moment all the time. What is the present moment? You know, what are these things we say? Uh, all I know is it's a moment, the present moment is always um, vanishing, right? This is the fleeting world we live in. This is what the Buddha taught us. So you should view this fleeting world, see the world this way, like a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a fan. That fleeting is the present moment. And yet, when we tune into just how it is right now, which I want to invite you to do, to tune into just how it is right now and do a short practice together before I introduce George Mumford, who's going to be our first speaker. So find a place that you're sitting, the place that you're sitting, see if you can be comfortable there. Um, I mean, you can sit up straight. It's always helpful to stay awake for sitting up straight, but just be relaxed, be at ease. Because this is a practice of embodying love. And before we can embody and share love with the world, we need to be able to receive it. So I call this practice the jelly roll because it's very sweet. And you can close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that in the group or just leave them partway open. And I want to invite you, we're going to use our imaginations for this meditation. I just want to invite you to gather around you, picture them or feel them close in a circle. People who like you, people who love you. And the criterion is just that if something good happens to you, they're happy. That's how you decide who you want to put in your circle. It doesn't matter how many or how few. You can put your pets in. You can put in people who have already passed away. I always put my parents in my circle, even though they've been gone for a long time because they would be happy when something good happened in my life. So pick people who look upon you with eyes of fondness, warmth, affection, caring, friendliness, and love. Just take a moment to arrange them around you. And look into their eyes one by one. And see if you can actually take in their positive regard for you. Just letting yourself kind of soak in. their love. And just going around seeing how it is to receive this love, this caring. Breathing in, breathing out. 
Breathing in the warmth and affection. Releasing any awkwardness or shyness you may feel about being the center of this kind of attention. Just wishing well for you. And when you're ready, you can look at each person, offer maybe a little bow of acknowledgement or a hug, depending on your relationship. A pat on the head if it's your dog. But just one by one, appreciating each of these beings. They're embodying love for you and transmitting their love and caring to you to strengthen you. To meet the challenges of your personal, professional, community, life. Just one by one acknowledging them. And their caring that steeps with, steeps like tea, growing stronger with attention and time. visible to us when we take the time to dive under the surface ripples of loneliness and separation and find each other and find ourselves. And when you're ready, as you look at each person and just let them kind of wrap one by one around you and dissolve into your heart. Just letting each one melt into your heart. opening your eyes. And this is our liberated and joyful heart. Even with climate change, patriarchy, racism, poverty, all the conflicts and divisions in our world, we can embody this love and offer it to our world near and far. And now I want to introduce and welcome George Mumford. George is a dear friend of mine for decades now. He comes from my um, native town of Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's from Boston now and flew here from Boston. And George uh, was a basketball player at UMass where he roomed with Dr. J, Julius Irving. And he... He was basically a basketball fanatic until injuries um, forced him out of the game that he really loved. And he uh, got involved with the medications that helped him numb his pain and actually uh, used those medications to numb his heart, the emptiness that he felt without his game. But after years of making meditation the center of his life, recovery and meditation, and getting clean, uh, George 
enrolled in John Kabat-Zinn's uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction program, and together they created a whole inner city uh, MBSR, inner city stress, stress clinic in the early 90s. And then when Michael Jordan left the Bulls to play baseball, they were devastated. And Phil Jackson reached out to John, looking for somebody who could help the team. And the rest is history. George became their mindfulness coach. He led them to um, championships. And many of the teams he coached became uh, NBA champions. And as Kobe Bryant, five-time NBA champion, said, George helped me understand the art of mindfulness. To be neither distracted or focused, rigid or flexible, passive or aggressive, I learned to just be. So, we're really happy that George came. Really honored to have you here, George. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. It's, it's great to be here. I feel like I'm, I'm home again. I, back in the day, I used to spend about 90 days out here working with the LA Lakers. And now I come, come out here to hang out at Inside LA as well as other places. <clears throat> so I had to take the jacket off because I felt like I was restricted. And before I found this practice, I was restricted. And so there's a lot I want to talk about, and I'm excited that you're here. So I want to talk a little bit, but I want to have some exchange. I like the Socratic style of uh, Q&A. Um, and it's interesting because when people introduce me, I say, did I do all that? Because <laughs> I don't remember being there. <laughs> and that's the secret. I wasn't there. I was there, but I wasn't there. I was just there serving, and it was out of, out of love. And I think love is the answer. It's interesting because when they talk about loving awareness or mindful loving awareness, it's this idea of, well, how was I able to overcome substance abuse and then chronic pain? And how was I able to go into all of these different venues from Yale to jail, locker rooms to border rooms, uh, all sorts of folks, all sorts of things. Even coming here today and being in this environment, it's interesting because I've been involved in a lot of these spiritual centers, but I wasn't really there. And so I, I was reflecting recently, and I realized I don't belong anywhere, but because I don't belong anywhere, I do belong everywhere. And because um, I forget myself, I find myself. And so this practice has been really powerful in this idea of love or at least having, having a mind in this state of, of openness and being willing to relate to people. So one of the things I talk about a lot is that we start off with the, with the tremendous gift of birth and the fact that we have Buddha nature in this culture, that's what we call it, you can call it a masterpiece, Christ consciousness, Kuan Yin energy. Call it whatever you want, divine spark. But we have it. And so what enables me to go in and work with these in these places is the fact that I'm going in there not trying to fix anybody. I'm just trying to do what Michelangelo talked about when they asked him how does he create these masterpieces out of these blocks of marble. And he says, all I do is chip away to get to the masterpiece that's already there. So that's all I do. So when I went in in 1993 and worked with the Chicago Bulls, they had already, they had just won three NBA championships. So I go in there and it's like, okay, I have no idea what I'm doing. And, but I do know this, that if I share my experience, strength, and hope with them, if I talk to them about what it means to be present for life, if I talk to them about uh, how I was able to overcome 
When I was in college, I saw myself as a basketball player. I was really quiet, very sensitive. Now I'm not playing basketball, who am I? So it took me years to figure out who I was. And then, so when I thought about it, I said, okay, well, I can just share my journey with them. And I could just look at them and say, hey, uh, what do you want? And then who do you need to be to do what you want to do? And so I talked to them about my experience room with Dr. J, my experience with martial arts, my experience being in flow or in the zone. And it's interesting because what is the zone? What is flow? And people, how many people have been in flow or see it, have seen it, right? You know what that really is? All that is is being spontaneous. That's all it is. But the mind, body, heart, and spirit, or soul, or whatever you want to call it, have to be on the same page at the same time. And so we train the mind. We train the body. But as my friend Yogi Berra said, 90% of baseball is mental, and the other half is physical. <laughs> I feel that life is like that. 90% of it is mental, the other half is physical. And so we have to work those muscles. We have to understand what are we doing and why are we doing it. And so for me, when I can align myself with right, right, what we call right view, when I can come in with a loving heart, when I can talk about love, not as a feeling, but as a as a pro productivity or as a work or as a sharing, being a service. And I, and I like the way Eric Fromm talked about it. He talked about it this way. He said, okay, George, he didn't talk to me, but this is how I heard it. Okay, George, if you're going to have self-love, then you have to have self-knowledge. You, you have to know thyself. And once you know yourself, then you have to be willing to accept yourself as you are. You are a unique human being, and so I have to respect who I am, not who I want to be, or who I think I am, but to be who I am. And the only way I can do that is be still and know and start to look at myself, start to look at my words, thoughts, and deeds, and understand how I am expressing or how I am being. And so just knowing myself and, and accepting myself or accepting my Okay, I just got, okay, my gifts. So when I, what does that mean? That means maybe I'm not supposed to be a basketball player. Maybe I'm supposed to be doing what I'm doing. Maybe I got, maybe when I was in college and, and I got injured and I couldn't play anymore, maybe that was the beginning of my life instead of the end of my life. And so once I accepted, accepted that, accepted the fact that I had a substance abuse issue, and that if I didn't accept that, then I wouldn't be able to change it. So when I see myself as just somebody who's, you know, uh, wants, to, wants to be loved, wants to be connected, wants to have more life, then I could deal with that. And so when I accept that, then the question is, okay, am I going to care for myself? What does care mean? Taking care of myself, being loving, being compassionate, seeing myself with kind eyes. And then it also means I have to respond to my own needs, which means, and I love the existential approach of I am the author of my own life. I am responsible, period. No blame. And once I can accept responsibility for myself, then I can respond and care for myself as I understand myself to be, not only as my individual self, but how, what it means to be a human being and what this, this uh, tradition talks about taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Well, what is that about? The Buddha just says that I have Buddha nature, that I, just like, like the Buddha, I can awaken or I can alleviate suffering, but I have to realize that I'm causing it. And what does the Sangha mean? That means that, that they're, I don't have to do this alone and that the other people are doing it. Dharma is just about these teachings. So I, I was having a conversation with, with a young man and, well, not just a young man, but people I work with, I say to them, you don't have to believe in gravity. But if you jump up, you will come down. 
So you don't have to believe in it. You don't have to believe in any of this stuff. This is a Buddhist said, don't believe me. See for yourself. And so when I was in college, people told me, yeah, George, you should meditate. You could do Tai Chi. You could do yoga. And I said, give me a brew and, and get out of my face because I don't believe in any of that stuff. But when my butt got on fire, what I call the AOF method of motivation, what is that? AOF, ass on fire. <laughs> so my ass was on fire. I said, well, maybe I should check that stuff out. Let me see if it'll work. And so for me, and that's the same, I work with a lot of people. They say, oh, I want to be like Mike. Then I said, okay, this is what it takes to be like Mike. And they said, I don't want to be like Mike. <laughs> I ain't in that much of, you know, there's no sense of urgency. And so just realizing that there's a sense of urgency and realizing that even to the degree that when I was first teaching, I wanted to teach at IMS, CIMC, and Spirit Rock wasn't there yet. Um, and so... Thank <laughs> you.